GI function in health. We'll be discussing digestion and elimination, liver support, product selection and usage. Each of us needs a customized customized protocol, but there are basics that, that really are the backbone of digestion and elimination that we all can use. Let's think about the body um, as a river. A river starts at the snow cap, goes to the tributaries, to the stream, to the body of the river, and then out into the ocean. Our bodies work the same way. The cells drain into the lymphatic system, which then drains into the liver, the gallbladder, the intestines, and then out. So we have to make sure the river is flowing. If you had a river with three or four dams in it, and you wanted to get the, everything flowing from the top down, you wouldn't start opening the dams higher up the river. You would start downstream and work your way upstream. And that's what we need to do with our body. If someone's constipated and they need to do a detox, you don't want to start loosening up all the toxins in the body because they'll just get jammed up at that lower dam, the intestinal blockage. So always start downstream and work your way upstream. That way when people are cleaning up their body, doing a detox, they'll feel better as they go along. They won't be feeling worse. Without proper digestion, the body does not receive the nourishment and can't perform the functions it needs to sustain life and health will be jeopardized. Some common problems we're having on a yearly basis in the U.S. Non-foodborne gastroenteritis, 135 million cases. There were 76 million cases per year of foodborne illness, 19 million cases of GERD, and 15 million cases of irritable bowel syndrome. This is going up every single year. Americans spend over $500 a year on laxatives per person. That's from newborns right through seniors. That's a lot of GI problems. Another interesting tidbit, toenail fungus in North America was at 2% um, 20 years ago. It's now at 14%. An interesting fact, 20 years ago was when the H2 Zantac became very popular and we started suppressing the acid formation in the body, changing the environment of the digestive system and changing the pH of the body, and funguses started going crazy. So we really have to think back on what can we do to restore the environment in our body back to the way it should be. 60 to 70 percent of our immune system is located in the gut. If there are immune system problems, we start getting constant colds, autoimmune problems, allergies, asthma, skin problems. And the allergies, asthma, and skin problems really are coming from the digestive system. If we go back to embryology, when we were being formed, one of the groups of cells differentiated and started becoming the lining of the digestive system. It also became the lining of our skin, our sinuses, and the lungs. Chinese have always said that the skin is a window into the digestive system, and this is one of the reasons. If the gut is inflamed and leaking, we start having skin problems. Then it moves into sinus pro chronic sinus problems, allergies, and eventually asthma. And if you start looking at different people and talking to them, you'll see this progression over and over again. The gut can be damaged by poor diet, lack of sufficient water intake, overuse of laxatives or antacids, antibiotics and medication. And again, we use more laxatives per capita than any other country in the world. The National Institute of Health in February 2009 published a report. The total cost of GI-related problems in the U.S. for a year. The reflux costs $12.6 billion, gallstones and gallbladder disease, $6.2 billion. So that's almost $19 billion spent on just these two digestive problems, which are pretty much avoidable if we would only take care of our body. These problems cause a loss of quality of life, productivity, a decrease in longevity, and cost society a fortune in dollars. So a healthy GI tract helps us digest food, it helps us absorb the, product, the products of digestion, 
ca helps carry nutrients across the intestinal lining, which is a barrier into the bloodstream so our body can use all these wonderful nutrients. Um, it helps with detoxification, and again, it helps support our immune system. Here's a, a cute schematic of our digestive system. At its simplest, the digestive system is a tube running from the mouth to the anus. This tube is like an assembly line, or realistically, a disassembly line. Its chief goal is to break down the huge macromolecules we eat, the proteins, fats, and starches, which can't be absorbed in that form into smaller molecules, the amino acids, fatty acids, and glucose that can be absorbed across the wall of the tube and into the circulatory system for dissemination around the body. When you're looking at this system, you can see we have to chew our food well, we should be relaxed, and different areas do different, um, have different functions. Now, a lot of people have gas and very smelly gas, so their stools are very odorous. That's from the food fermenting, not digesting. A good analogy, if you take your food in the middle of the summer, grind it up in a food processor, put it in a Ziploc bag and leave it on the counter at 98 degrees, it would be pretty smelly, gassy, and disgusting. So if you start getting bloated or you know someone that gets bloated after they eat and their gas and the stools are very odorous, they're not digesting the food, they're not getting the nutrients out of their food that they need, it's fermenting, and that isn't healthy. These green guys are the healthy bacteria. They help release vitamins, they help break down food, they scrub the intestinal lining, keep it nice and clean and working well. We have over 500 species of bacteria totaling about a hundred trillion bacteria in our gut. And that's more, there are more bacteria in the gut than there are cells in our body. The total weight of the healthy bacteria in the gut is about four pounds for the average adult. And several ounces of new bacteria are born every day and leave every day through bowel elimination. If you think about a lawn, if the soil is healthy and you're watering it, and you have good grass, you overseed regularly and take care of it, it grows and thrives and expands and it keeps the weeds in check. If you don't have a good environment for the lawn, the weeds take over and you start using weed poison or crabgrass killer all the time. And if you don't put down crabgrass killer, the crabgrass or the weeds take over and the good grass dies. This is very similar to what goes on in the digestive system. If we don't take care of the environment and keep overseeding with probiotics, the opportunistic organisms, parasites, candida start blooming. So the intestinal flora help synthesize vitamins, produce antimicrobial products, and help prevent colonization of pathogens. We all have some of these in our gut, but they should be in the background. Dysbiosis is a term used to describe an imbalance of the bacteria in the digestive tract. Uh, there's too much yeast or harmful bacteria, viruses, or parasites in the intestines. It can occur in the GI tract, the oral cavity, or the vaginal cavity, and it leads to a parasitic or yeast overgrowth. These are some pictures of some of the opportunistic organisms or parasites that could take over our gut. The best place to pick up a parasite, the airport handrails and the seats on the air, the handrails at the escalators at the airport, and the seats and hand the armrests. If you think about it, most people when they go to the bathroom still aren't washing their hands. Then they grab the doorknob in the public bathroom and open it up. Then we wind up washing our hands, but we grab the same doorknob. Even if you washed your hands and used a paper towel to open the bathroom door, you go to get on the plane, you're touching the armrests, and then you put on the seat, you, the seat belt, and you grabbed a buckle that thousands of people, most, half of them who haven't washed their hands use. Then you get your snack from the stewardess, pour it in your hand and into your mouth. It's a prime way to get a good parasite, a bad parasite. And there's really no way around it because we're exposed to this everywhere. You want to keep washing your hands, doing the best you can, but your best defense is keeping a healthy digestive system.
the good bacteria form a coating or a lining along the epithelial cells in, in the gut, in the intestinal tract. They help only allow things that should get absorbed to be absorbed. They help with detoxing, they help with the immune system, and they also help contribute to energy production. How do you identify if someone has dysbiosis? Well, if they've had a history of antibiotic use, they have carb cravings, bloating, fatigue, multiple food or chemical sensitivities, difficulty concentrating, or any of the itises, vaginitis, esophagitis, dermatitis, proctitis, they have dysbiosis. How many of us know someone that have at least one or two of these? These are all signs of dysbiosis. With a few simple suggestions, you can feel much better. You should be adding a digestive enzyme and a probiotic. This is why probiotics, digestive enzymes, liver support, and antioxidant support very, is very important for everyone. It can help with funguses, fibromyalgia, eczema, dry eye, tinnitus, cramping, depression, diabetes, and as we go through some of these slides, you'll see why this all links together. Some of the causes of dysbiosis, antibiotic use, stress, oral contraceptives, chemo or radiation, traveling. Traveling is a lot of fun, but you're exposed to a lot of things that your immune system may not be used to dealing with, and also it can be stressful. Also, we can have low hydrochloric acid, we can have a poor diet, bad food, high sugar, fluoride or chlorine in the water. That's pretty hard to avoid. Um, we can also be exposed to different toxins which can goof up our digestive system. What's the best way to create dysbiosis? The standard American diet. We have high sugar, high fat, cholesterol and sodium, refined and processed foods, low fiber and minerals, low fatty acids, preservatives, and toxins in the meat. Um, the average American today consumes 150 pounds of sugar per year. Of this, 60% is high fructose corn syrup, 40% is table sugar. Um, sugar inhibits white blood cell movement and affects the immune system within 30 minutes after ingestion. So if you are eating a high, you have four or five sugars in your coffee, you've suppressed your immune system within 30 minutes. Antibiotics, they're a big cause of dysbiosis and they destroy all bacteria. They're not a smart bomb that just target the bad guys. Those of us that ever took erythromycin years ago, um, usually when prescription was filled for erythromycin, people would take it for a day or two um, women would get vaginal yeast infections, we'd be very crampy, diarrhea, very bad, upset stomach, so we would say we're allergic to it, and they'd switch our antibiotic. The interesting thing was most people weren't allergic to it. It's just that the mycin drugs kill over 99% of the good or beneficial bacteria within a day or two. So it was that the drug was too effective. Not only were we killing the bad guys, but we were doing a real job on the good bacteria. Using antacids, proton pump inhibitors, etc., compromises the gut's ability to digest protein, causing it to sit there and go bad. Partially digested material rots and decays in the gut, and that helps build up toxins, and we'll see what the toxins do to our system in a few minutes. What are some of the effects of, of dysbiosis. There's localized gut inflammation, systemic inflammation, um, altered production and synthesis of neurotransmitters. When the gut isn't working well, we don't absorb the building blocks we need to make serotonin and norepinephrine and epinephrine and dopamine. Um, it can affect intestinal permeability. It can lead to chronic infections, impaired detoxing, impaired energy. It can affect the hormones and cause autoimmune problems can lead to bacterial overgrowth, parasites, infections. We talked about the nail fungus overgrowths, IBS, leaky gut, mental and emotional problems, chronic disorders and diseases, and degenerative diseases. So when you think about it, 
the gut really is at the root of many of our problems. And if we don't get the gut in balance, we're never going to get ahead of a lot of these very serious, very common problems. This is a great schematic. If you look at the top in the green, there's diet, lifestyle, and environment. And they all can have a positive or negative effect on digestion. If any of the green, the diet, lifestyle, or environment are off, digestion's off. And when digestion isn't working well, it has a negative effect on the liver and the immune system. And if the immune system's off, that can affect the liver and vice versa. So if any of the top row are off, it affects the middle section. If any of the middle section's off, it can lead to muscular problems, respiratory, neurological, endocrine, reproductive, skin diseases like eczema, or cardiovascular disease. So this is really how poor digestion leads to, can lead to any of these problems. And if you have any of these problems, you're never going to get ahead of them until you correct the digestion, which then means you have to correct your diet, lifestyle, and environment. So you can flow downward or upward, but everything affects everything else. This is a picture of our liver, and we can spend hours on liver function, try to make it as concise as possible. The liver, um, when we're sleeping, when we're getting good REM sleep, it does most of the detoxing. There's phase one and phase two. Phase one takes a look at the fat-soluble toxins. They can be metabolic end products, contaminants, pollutants, pesticides, drugs, alcohol, and it converts them to water-soluble substances. The problem is these water-soluble substances are even more damaging to the body. So after phase one, it has to go right into phase two, which takes these very reactive and dangerous water-soluble products and deactivates them, makes them harmless to the body. Then the body eliminates them either through the gallbladder, the bile to the stool, or the kidneys and the urine, depending upon the molecular size of the products. So phase one and phase two really have to work in sync. And we need a good night's sleep and good adrenal function for phase one and phase two to work. Some nutrients are essential for good phase two detoxing and to keep up with phase one. Phase one will just rattle right along. Phase two is really the limiting factor. So if phase one is working, and we're low on some of our antioxidants, which are used in phase two, we have all these very toxic, now water-soluble substances that the liver can't deal with. And this can be very, very dangerous. And if you look, the glycine, glutamine, taurine, cysteine are all needed in phase two. Those are also some of the amino acids we need to make neurotransmitters. So if your diet's off and you don't have enough of these, or if you're in a toxic environment, so the liver's working overtime, you're using more of these, you could be having less amino acids available to make neurotransmitters. So this is tied into the mental health side of it, too. And if you look at, this is a brief list on the right of some of the antioxidants we need. You don't want to load up high doses of any one. You need some of all the antioxidants. So you really need to be taking a good formula that has all of them, because the body uses them like a daisy chain to help deactivate these water-soluble toxins. So toxins can come from many places. And here's a guy, you can see he's holding his right side right below the rib cage. That's where the larger lobe of the liver is, where a lot of us, when the liver starts getting overloaded, we start having discomfort. Now, toxins can come from many areas, and one thing we don't think about is toxic thoughts. If you are a negative person, you usually age faster, and you have more illness. And that's because the negative thoughts really do generate a lot of toxic metabolic products. So we have to try to keep a positive attitude. We can get toxins from the environment, toxins from the immune system. We can have toxins from normal digestion. You know, there's a lot of toxic things we make, and the liver needs to deal with it, as long as we're not overloading the liver with chemicals. There's also toxins from the mitochondria. 
They're our energy center in every single cell. They generate more free radicals than any other place in the body. But the body, if we're living right and we're eating well and digestion's working, the body can handle all those free radicals. We talked about the toxins from the P450 enzymes. That's phase one. So we have to make sure we keep the liver and the system flowing well. The P450 enzymes are also what we need for digest for de detoxifying all the drugs. And this is why taking acetaminophen or ibuprofen can be very dangerous long term because it overloads the P450 enzyme pathways and then the liver can't go and do what it needs to do. And there's also toxins caused from the Cox and Lox enzymes. Some of the effects of these toxins are gas and digestive problems, bloating, heart problems, brain fog, aches and pains, itching and skin problems, hormone problems, and depleted energy. A poorly functioning liver can amplify the incoming toxins and dump them into the lymph system and the kidneys, creating a whole host of symptoms throughout the body. When the liver starts getting backed up, we get bloating. And it can be real serious bloating. So the best way to keep from having this is a clean diet and a clean life. Here's the link on, one of the links on the neurotransmitters. When the body starts getting toxic, the digestive system isn't working well and you could get a leaky ileocecal valve. This allows some of the good bacteria that should be living only in the large intestine to get into the small intestine. So they become bad guys. They were good when they were where they were supposed to be. When they get into the small intestines, they start eating a lot of the nutrients that we should be absorbing. One of them is tryptophan. We need tryptophan to get absorbed to make 5-HTP, which then is converted into serotonin. At night, when we're getting ready to sleep, the body converts serotonin to melatonin. That helps us get into REM sleep and get a good REM sleep cycle. When we're in REM sleep, that's when the liver does most of its cleanup and detoxing. So if you have dysbiosis and you have bacteria where they shouldn't be, you can be low in the absorption of tryptophan and other nutrients, which then will make you low in serotonin and melatonin. That can lead to depression, it can lead to sleep issues, and also it can affect norepinephrine levels, dopamine levels, and serotonin levels. So then you get into the mood and anxiety issues. So is the only reason for mood and anxiety problems the gut? No, but it's a very, very big part of it. And so we really have to look at the gut no matter what we're trying to um, help someone with. The aches and pains. When the liver gets overloaded, toxins, fluid, and proteins are dumped into the lymph system and this can really mess up the immune system. Once the immune system is overloaded, it can either respond by underreacting or overreacting. If it responds too weakly, the person gets colds all the time. They catch everything that comes around. If the immune system fights back too strongly, then allergies and autoimmune diseases can develop. The liver can use up the body's supply of antioxidants when it's working hard, and this can weaken ligaments, tendons, cartilage, discs, blood vessels, the eyes, the nails, and other connective tissue. The immune system can generate tremendous quantities of free radicals, and that can also cause a big problem. Now, if the liver is overloaded and it can't deactivate all these toxins, it releases them back into the system and they get buried in the connective tissue. And this is why fibromyalgia and a lot of the conditions on that, in that um, arena are really detoxing or toxicity issues. People with fibromyalgia, if they have a couple of good nights sleep, usually their aches and pains and symptoms and foggy brain start dissipating. If they have a couple of bad nights sleep, their aches and pains are even worse. And that's because when they're not sleeping, the liver's burying this in the connective tissue. It can't detoxify the body properly. When the liver's detoxification enzymes get overloaded, some of the toxins spill over into the blood and get dumped into the kidneys. They weren't designed to deal with this. They don't know how to neutralize it. 
So they get put into the, di the urinary tract, which then creates irritation of the urinary tract, and the body tries to push the toxins out through the skin. Nature gave us our skin as a safety valve. When we can't get toxins out through the kidneys or through the liver, when we perspire, they come out through the skin. So whenever anyone has, starts having itching or really bad urticaria, that really is a kidney issue, which then goes back to a liver issue. So you have to keep looking at why the problem is. Why isn't the body dealing with it? And that gets you back to where you really have to work on. Now, the kidneys control mineral levels. So if the kidneys start getting overloaded, you can have a calcium deficiency, which can allow good bacteria from the large intestine to, f to get by the ileocecal valve into the small intestine, where it, those bacteria will start eating tryptophan B and B12. And there we are with the B12 deficiency. If it's not due to someone bleeding, it could be to poor um, GI flora, or the flora is in the wrong spot. When the liver enzymes become too jammed up with toxins, hormones aren't effectively broken down. So another enzyme system is used. We always have backup systems. Now, when we start talking in women about estrogen, the desired route for estrogen processing is through the C2 liver pathway. The C2 pathway creates mild hormones that aren't dangerous, and this is part of the P450 enzyme and the conjugation enzyme pathways. These are the same enzymes that toxins entering the liver need to be detoxified by. Now the, the body will look at what is the most dangerous substance and try to work on that first. So if we're taking a lot of acetaminophen or ibuprofen or we have a lot of man-made chemicals coming into our body, the P450 enzyme works on that first, but it still has to deal with estrogen. So there's the 16A um, or the 16 alpha pathway that can be used. And if estrogen goes through the 16 alpha pathway, it produces 16 alpha hydroxyestrone. That's a killer hormone. That's the cancer causing hormone from estrogen. So if our livers are overloaded, a woman's chance of getting cancer skyrockets. So we have to be very, very careful not to overload our, um, our liver. What can we do to lower our risk? Diet plays a very important role in detoxifying. So diet and supplementation um, are great. If we're toxic, we need antioxidants, we need good food, we need good fiber. The liver's detoxification enzymes are weakened by the wrong diet choices. If you're eating a standard American diet, your detox pathways don't stand a chance of keeping up with even just the normal metabolic waste. Diet plays a huge role in the production of eicosanoid hormones. There are two different types depending upon which pathway and what oils or fats they come from. Some of them can make you feel real good, some of them can make you feel real bad. And that's why changing your diet to a healthier diet, people usually start feeling better very, very rapidly. Many foods have built-in substances that the body can put to good use to correct hormone problems, encourage weight gain or loss, influence mood changes, and prevent heart disease and autoimmune diseases. So diet is really the first step. The second step is minimize putting things into the body that are already toxic, such as toxic fats, sugar, coffee, and alcohol, and don't overeat. When a person eats more than they can readily digest, any extra is likely to be food for the bacteria, and the liver will wind up having to deal with even more toxins. Extra food that gets absorbed is like, likely to be stored as fat around your abdomen or pushed through the mitochondria as extra fuel, which will rev them up and could set off a fireworks of free radical activity, which creates more toxins for the liver to deal with. If your digestion is weak, it's better to eat frequently, small meals rather than several large ones. Avoid eating at night because digestion decreases normally at night. So if you do eat a big meal at night, this will allow the bacteria to have extra time to ferment the undigested food. Even melatonin may not help one sleep if their liver is backed up with toxins. 
they'll probably be awake between 1 and 3 a.m. when toxins such as homocysteine are most likely to get sent out of the liver because the liver's overloaded and this irritates the brain and wakes you up. Here are some different ways to support the liver and the digestive system. Both digestion and detoxification are a big part of this process. There can be nutritionals, digestive enzymes, a good multiple vitamin, zinc, potassium, and calcium are needed for a lot of the enzyme pathways to help detoxify. There are homeopathic remedies that are very supportive of the liver, and we'll go into those in a few more slides. And there are botanicals that are very, very helpful. The dandelion, milk thistle, Oregon grape root, um, rosemary, blue flag, these are all supportive of the hepatocytes. They also help support phase one and phase two detoxing. If someone has sleep problems, um, have them eat their main meal at lunchtime and enjoy a lighter vegetarian meal later in the day. Vegetable protein contains only half as much methionine as animal protein, which means there'll be less homocysteine at night to irritate the brain. Certain foods are very hard to digest quickly, especially legumes and grains. They're often not completely digested, and some of the complex sugars pass into the large intestines. They're not supposed to get in there. And that's where the bacteria in the large intestines can make a phenomenal amount of gas from them. Sugars like lactose and fructose can also add to this gastric symphony of bubbles. Now there's a chronic gas problem. Things are even worse. It's worse because that's an indication of a weakened ileocecal valve, which means some of these bacteria are getting into the small intestines, which are going to rob you of a lot of the nutrients we need for health. There are seven things that we talked about them a little bit before that can cause the liver to get overloaded. There's toxins in the diet, so you want to avoid rancid fats, the hydrogenated fats, highly refined carbs. There's toxins made by the intestinal flora. You want to put in a good multi-strain probiotic. There's toxins made by the P450 enzymes, just normal metabolic function. So you want to support your conjugation enzymes with nutrients and protein. If bloating occurs, sometimes eating grapefruit can help slow down the P450 enzymes. And what this does is it slows down phase one, so phase two can get caught up. This is one of the reasons people who take um, thyroid hormones shouldn't have grapefruit around that time, because you need the P450 enzymes to use the thyroid hormone. Exercise is another wonderful thing. It stimulates the liver. The liver doesn't have any muscles. So as we <coughs> exercise and move around, that squeezes the liver and releases the liver. And that helps it do uh, get the blood flow through, and it helps with the um, phase one and phase two detoxing. Also, when we exercise, we breathe deep through our abdomen, not just up in the lungs, not a shallow breath. So slow, deep breathing is very, very helpful. It can be toxins made by the immune system, the mitochondria, we talked about that, the cox and lox enzymes, and one of the big ones, again, toxins made by the mind, harboring gloom and doom attitudes, negative thought patterns. Um, that's very, very important to get a nice positive attitude. If you bloated or abdominal pain, even menstrual cramps, castor oil packs can be very, very helpful. You take a piece of flannel cloth and soak it in castor oil. Take a towel, heat it up with hot water, wring it out and put it on the affected area. For about 10 minutes, you want to moisten and warm the area. Then you lay the flannel sheet that's soaked in castor oil on the skin and put another hot, moist towel on top of it. And about 15 minutes, twice a day. And this is wonderful. It can be for muscle injuries, for gas and bloating, for stomach aches, cramps, menstrual cramps. Very, very helpful. Regular exercise, massage therapy, yoga, aromatherapy baths can help with relaxation improve, and improve blood flow and help with detoxing. You want to add a multi-strain probiotic to provide the friendly flora for the GI tract, including the Saccharomyces, Lactobacillus, and the Bifido, which aids in healing the upper gut the upper digestive system. 
and colostrum help support the immune system. DGL licorice, very, very good. And it's an effective alternative to antacids and acid-blocking drugs. By comparison with the acid-blocking drugs, DGL works not by inhibiting <coughs> acid production, but rather by supporting and stimulating the stomach's natural protective mechanisms. So you're helping the body heal and do its work appropriately, not suppressing. Once the liver's been supported, a low-strain detox can be done. So let's go back to the river. You have all the dams are open, the bottom dam, the, the bowel, the middle dam, the liver is open, so you can start loosening up all the toxins at the cellular level and they can just flow right out and so you'll detox without side effects. Common side effects of detoxing when the river isn't flowing are fatigue, headaches, pain, inflammation, bowel problems. So again, having the river flowing well is the first step to being able to do a good detox. Um, toxicity can lead to respiratory problems such as asthma or sinus, chronic sinus issues, abnormal body odor, bad breath, or a coated tongue, unexplained headaches, back and joint pains, or arthritis. These are all the toxins being buried in the connective tissue or the liver being overloaded. Environmental sensitivities, food allergies, or multiple um, allergies. Poor memory, mental confusion, insomnia, depression, irritability, or chronic fatigue. Brittle nails here, psoriasis, and adult acne, and being underweight or overweight are all signs that you need to do a good detox. Now how can we go from liver function to chronic degenerative disorders? It's very easy. The leaky gut releases toxins into the system, which then overloads the liver. The liver then has to release these toxins into the bloodstream, which pushes the toxins into the connective tissue and the muscles to store them. And that's a protective mechanism to keep them away from vital organs. The intestinal lining becomes even more damaged by a lot and then allows more toxins to pass through into the bloodstream. These toxins enter the bloodstream, triggering antibodies and cytokines to fight the antigens, and the cytokines alert the lymphocytes. Toxic antioxidants are produced as a result, which leads to more inflammation, and the cycle just keeps going around and around and around. So what do we need to do? First thing is putting in probiotics, the beneficial bacteria. They're responsible for the balance of the ecosystem in the bowel and the intestinal tract. With the right bacteria being supplemented, you have better hormonal function, better digestion and absorption, it can have a lowering of the bad cholesterol. It can help eliminate candida and other pathogens. So everyone should be taking a good, well-formulated probiotic. And anyone with a hormonal digestive disorder, cholesterol issue, candida, IBS, or constipation, probiotics are a must. As I said, they help with vitamin B production, hormonal activity, detoxing, they produce natural antibiotics, they enhance enzyme activity, they help reestablish, a good probiotic will help reestablish and colonize the microflora balance. You want it to contain lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, Saccharomyces boulardii are all very important. They, each of the bacteria, you want at least 12 different um, strains in your probiotic because each strain has a specific function. Just loading up on one strain really isn't a smart idea. You want to have a potent probiotic. It should have live cultures. You want them to be alive, not freeze-dried. You want them to multiply. You want to have multiple strains. There's very important strains that need to be in there. It should be a refrigerated probiotic because they're alive. You want to keep them alive. And they should be enterocoded, meaning not enterocoded, but they should be able to survive the acidity of the stomach. Sometimes people, when they come in, they say, I can't take probiotics because I either get diarrhea or gassy or I get constipated when I take them. Probiotics don't agree with me. That's the furthest thing from the truth. The probiotics are the natural bacteria that are supposed to be in the gut. 
So if someone takes a probiotic and they feel worse, that's really a good sign. That means that there's a lot of opportunistic organisms, and when you put the good bacteria in, the candida or the pathogens are dying. And when they die, all the material inside these cells releases, and that's what's causing the problem. So the solution is, one, to make sure they're sipping plenty of water through the day, and the second thing is have them take a, start with a pinch of a probiotic or a quarter of a tablet, quarter of a capsule, and slowly build up. These signs aren't um, a bad sign. They're a sign that they're moving in the right direction. Anyone who's on antibiotics should be taking a probiotic at least an hour or two after each dose. People who have a poor diet use chlorinated or fluoridated water or have gastrointestinal problems absolutely need a probiotic. Anyone taking oral contraceptives, alcohol, been exposed to toxic metals or environmental pollution, if you're a standard American diet eater, on medications, radiation, chemo, those who have negative thoughts or high stress, you are good bacteria or dying and bailing out. You really need it. What about babies? When a baby is born vaginally, they swallow some of mother's mucus, vaginal mucus, which has all the good bacteria. That's the initial seeding of the bacteria for the digestive system. When a baby is a C-section, they come out and they're not red and wrinkly with a pointed head, but they don't have any of the good bacteria, and we need that for our immune system and for digestion. These C-section babies usually, we're seeing more and more of them with severe reflux, gas, poor feeding habits. Adding in a probiotic to the mother, because it goes through the breast milk, and giving it directly to the baby usually will help correct these problems within days. The babies or the parents that are coming in that the kids are getting recurrent ear infections, or have infant eczema, they were born within the first week, they have bad eczema or acne, most likely they were a C-section baby, and putting a probiotic in is really all that's needed to correct this problem. If the mom and the baby have yeast and they're passing it back and forth, have the mother put a little bit of the probiotic on her finger and put it in the baby's mouth. Also, after she feeds, she can massage a little breast milk with a little probiotic mixed in on her nipple, and that'll help displace the yeast. If you get the baby feeling better, if the mother's feeling better, everyone's sleeping better, and everyone's really much happier. Now we'll just quickly go into a couple of different protocols. The basic gut protocol, which is really the backbone of all the detoxification programs, and also it's a good <coughs> program to be on the rest of your life. It starts off with Optozyme or Enterozyme, they're digestive enzymes. Now, there's a lot of enzymes on the market. You want to make sure you're getting an, an enzyme product that has multiple enzymes that cover all the different food groups. Also, there are some small amounts of nutrients, of minerals, that are needed for the body to be able to use these enzymes. They're cofactors. And if you don't have enough of those, you're not going to be able to utilize the enzymes. So Optozyme and Enterozyme are both formulated with everything the body needs for these enzymes to be very beneficial. Dandy Comp was the botanical I mentioned earlier. It's a combination to support the liver. It supports both phase one and phase two detoxing. Very, very helpful to get the liver going. I use a lot of Dandy Comp women who are having menstrual migraines. They have cyclical migraines. And most of the time, they'd say it's on the right-hand side of the, of the head. That's the liver headache, according to the Chinese. That means the liver's backed up. And it, when the hormone levels go up near the end of her cycle, the body can't metabolize it properly, and that triggers the headache. By using Dandycom, we can support the liver, get better phase one, phase two detoxing, and most of the time, the headache goes away. Neutroplenish GI is a wonderful vitamin product. The backbone of it is a good multiple vitamin and antioxidant. It also contains minerals, enzymes, botanicals, and amino acids that help support the digestive system. I recommend two tablets three times a day. Some people get up to three three times a day. But you don't want to give more
more than what the body needs, especially at the beginning. So I always start with two, three times a day and have them work up if they can. The liver gallbladder HP is our um, best-selling homeopathic product. It's very, very gentle and very good for liver support and gallbladder support, both for symptoms and also to help support the function. A lot of people have a problem staying hydrated. They're sipping enough water, but they just don't seem to absorb it. Hydrate, you add to your water when you drink it, and it's very, very good at helping the body absorb the water at the cellular level. Probiotics, the enterobiotic SIGC, our enterobiotic SBO, it has the soil-based organisms in it. It's a multi-strain probiotic. It's refrigerated, it's acid stable, it gets through the stomach into the intestines. We should be adding flaxseed oil or fish oil for our omega-3. And we talked about either licorice extract or the DGL, which is very, very helpful for if someone's having um, reflux or acid indigestion. For liver support, if you look at it, uh, the top section, it really is, again, the same gut protocol, that same core protocol. There are a few things that have changed. Potassium chloride is added because we need added potassium if we're supporting the liver. And there's also a homeopathic called hepatocode, which is specific for the liver. Um, we want to do a dysbiosis program to help support the liver. We want to tighten up the gut, high fiber, and a low strain detox. Again, you want to add your enterobiotic, the friendly bacteria, and the DGL. So you can see each of these formulas really are built on the gut formula, of the GI protocol, and it's just tweaked depending upon what added support the person needs. When someone's ready to detox after you have the river flowing well, you first thing you want to do is clean up their diet, avoid toxins, avoid overeating and eating late at night. You want to make sure you have a good liver support in place because as you're loosening up these toxins, they have to go through the liver and you don't want the liver to get overwhelmed. That's what caused the problem in the first place. You want to try to reduce stress and get plenty of sleep and correct dysbiosis with a multi-strain probiotic. With a detox protocol, you need more N-acetyl-L-cysteine, um, glutamine, and those are very, very helpful for the liver for detoxing. The Nutriplenish Cell Detox is a wonderful product. The next slide will go into what's in that. You need the probiotic, dandy comp um, for the liver. The scrofolera comp is an herbal, very, very good for lymphatic drainage. So when you're detoxing, you're loosening up at the cellular level. You want to make sure it can flow. You All your dams are open. It can flow through the lymphatic system to the liver. Scrofolera helps with that. Then when it hits the liver, you want to make sure you're supporting the liver. There's your dandy comp and hepatocode. CoQ10, very important. So Nutriplenish Cell Detox is a wonderful program. And if you look at this, it's again the same multiple vitamin but it has support for m new areas. It supports phase two liver detox with glutamine, taurine, and cysteine. It supports adrenal function. Um, when we're toxic, the adrenals have been working overtime. They're usually getting a little tired and it takes more energy to detox. Very supportive. There's tyrosine to make sure there's plenty of tyrosine there for T3 and T4 thyroid hormones. There's some bromelain, which is an anti-inflammatory and part of the digestive enzyme complex. And also it has extra antioxidants. So as phase one is putting all this toxic material over to phase two, you have enough antioxidants so that phase one, phase two are in sync. You don't have that phase one overload. So the core products that really follow through just about any gut or detox protocol, again, are the enterobiotic, the Nutriplenish GI, the omega-3, the liver support with liver and gallbladder, HP and dandy comp, and then your digestive enzymes. Um, this is the liver gallbladder HP, a wonderful product. And if you look through the list, it's really 
you can see why it's so helpful. The remedies that are in there are very supportive of the body. It helps a weak liver and poor digestion. Um, if there's liver enlargement or tenderness, if there's liver um, the beginning of a little bit of gallbladder pain, not because it's a clogged bile duct, but um, if, the, if there's real irritation in that area, people are vomiting bile or spitting up bile. It can help get things flowing better. Great for flatulence, for gas, burning in the pit of the stomach, nausea, chronic vomiting, abdominal sensitivities. If your stomach is sensitive to pressure, this product is very gentle and supportive. So some general lifestyle recommendations. You want to limit stress, get adequate rest, massage therapy, yoga, aromatherapy baths, we talked about that, exercise, drinking plenty of water, but not downing 10 glasses of water. You want to be sipping all through the day. That allows the body to absorb the water, bring nutrients into the cells, and bring waste product out. You should be taking your body weight, divided by two, and that's how many ounces a day to work up to, and sipping it throughout the day. You'll find mental attitude and mental clarity improves, the skin gets better. Don't use aluminum cookware. If there's immune system issues, do some um, immune system support. Definitely stop tobacco use and other toxins. Cut down on chemicals that we're ingesting. Some general dietary recommendations. Avoid processed and refined foods, premixed baked goods, white flour, white bread, milk and dairy cut down on, eliminate diet soda, pork is very hard to digest. The sugars and processed sweets, luncheon meats, alcohol, caffeine, and carbonated beverages, the non-dairy creamers, hydrogenated fats, artificial sweeteners, margarine, and any known food allergen or irritant should be, determ should be determined and eliminated. We want to increase the amount of fresh fruit and vegetables and meats we eat, leafy green vegetables. Very, very good. The deeper the color, the more robust the color, the more antioxidants they provide. We should have adequate amounts of fiber, whole grains, the bulgur, brown rice, bran and oats, stevia or honey for sweetening, for sweetening. high protein snacks like raw nuts and seeds, nut butters. We should be eating more of the dried beans, eggs if you're not allergic to it. Eggs are a wonderful food. Non-hydrogenated fats, the olive oil, coconut oil, rice bran oil for cooking. Eliminate the allergen, the allergen foods that bother us. Again, you want to be sipping water all through the day. Quinoa is a wonderful thing to eat. It's very high in protein and it's a vegetable. This is a simple <coughs> circle and you can really jump in anywhere. We'll start up near the top. If someone's craving carbs, they're eating more refined carbs, which robs the body of nutrients, which decreases glucose tolerance factor, which then makes the body produce more insulin, but it's there's insulin resistance. The insulin's less effective. This causes the brain to crave sugar. The excess sugar that we ingest gets stored in the abdomen as fat. It also makes us more acidic. So the body takes calcium out of the bones and starts dumping calcium trying to deal with the pH issue. This causes more pain and inflammation. The lack of calcium causes a weakened ileocecal valve, which allows the good bacteria that are in the large intestines to get into the small intestines where they become bad bacteria. Then nutrients are robbed. Tryptophan and B12, amongst others, are starting to disappear and more toxins are released which overloads the liver which makes us more toxic which makes us crave carbs and you keep spinning out of control so as a repeat the standard protocol for GI problems enterozyme or optozyme good digestive enzyme with each meal licorice concentrate or DGL for the reflux and indigestion neutroplenish GI two tablets three times a day for most people, liver gallbladder, HP and dandy comp for liver support, the enterobiotic, putting the good bacteria in, and omega-3 support with fish oil or flax oil. Just 
going off the beaten track a little bit if someone's constipated, taking more magnesium, magnesium complex or mag four liquid. Very, very helpful and can get the bowel functioning better. Um, a lot of people who are magnesium deficient have restless leg or leg cramps, and they're usually constipated also. One of the homeopathics, Illumina 6C, that would be 10 drops two to three times a day. That's very good for constipation when you have rabbit pellets. You have round balls, the hard balls, or a stool made up of a bunch of hard balls. We use this a lot in the kids, the little kids that are constipated. Usually within a day or two, it gets the bowel working well. Remember to drink half of your body weight in ounces of water, but sipping it. Raisins, prunes, prune juice, some of the dried fruit, a good clean fiber product. Some of the herbs are very, very helpful in digestion and constipation. And eating less red meat, dairy, and shellfish. Eat more fish. The liver, gallbladder, and detoxification protocol. Um, we're back to the Nutriplenish GI. The liver support with liver, um, gallbladder, and dandycom, the enzymes, omega-3, and enterobiotic. But if there's a lot of, if you need liver work, add potassium chloride and the hepaticode. More potassium is very, very helpful when you're dealing with liver problems. You can also use a rebounder, sauna, lymphatic massage. They're all very good at getting the lymphatic system going and also the liver functioning better. If the gallbladder is an issue, again, it's the same basic gut protocol, Nutriplenish GI, liver gallbladder HP, Dandycom, omega-3, probiotic, but you add more taurine, which is very good to boost the bile acids and reduce gallstones. Phosphatidyl complex can help if there are gallstones and vitamin C. The digestive enzymes, of course, and consume foods that are high in fiber and water. Very, very important when you're trying to dissolve the stone.